Hello everyone, uh, this is the fourth segment of the Mesozoic and uh, here we have to start with the Mesozoic tectonics of Western North America. As the Atlantic Ocean widened uh, and North America have started to rift apart from Africa, uh, North America moved to the West and it has been overriding the Pacific Plate. Uh, because of the oceanic continental, oceanic oceanic and then oceanic continental plate boundary uplifted the mountains in the Cordilleras. Uh, this, this whole mountain formation was related to the opening of the Atlantic Ocean. So as you can see this here is because of the subduction. The, the whole area I have uplifted, there was a big foreland basin toward the middle of the continent and a lot of granite batholiths was forming during this time. And this slide shows you the uh, uh, oceanic, you know, as the oceanic arc collided into North America, uh, there was a whole lot of, uh, all this area was actually allochton, which means it, it, it came into America and its geology has nothing to do with the North American geology. Uh, we have all these orogenies, the Sonoma, the ne Nevada, you don't really have to know their names, don't even worry about it. So uh, we're just going to go to the next slide. Uh, we have, this is quite important that we have all these batholiths and the batholiths are forming because it's an oceanic continental plate boundary and in that area the magma is pretty phallic which means it doesn't move really quickly so a lot of the times actually it stays down there. Granite makes huge big granite batholiths, it will never, ma it won't make it to the surface. Some magma will come and make andesite volcanoes but a lot of the magma stays down as batholith. Uh, here are the most famous one, the Sierra Nevada, Idaho, and the coastal, coastal range batholiths. So that's that. And then these are all the other orogenies, the Laramide, the Cordillera have formed during this orogeny. So it's really, really important. Uh, it formed in New Mexico, Colorado, and Wyoming. And it actually, a lot of the activity happened on, on reactivated uh, Precambrian fault. And right now we are at the mineral and er energy resources of the Mesozoic, starting with the metallic minerals. And because of these battle, it's, and I just told you that there was some andesite uh, which are related to the battle, it's actually basically, these are the more uh, mobile magma which actually made it up to the surface and made andesite volcanoes like Mount St. Helens, Mount Lanier today, those are all andesitic uh, volcanoes, you know, stratovolcanoes. So the first very important minerals of this area is the gold. And uh, this is uh, exactly the area where the uh, 1849 California gold rush have happened. And uh, the gold actually was um, eroded from these mountains and it was a uh, place of deposit, which means it's place of deposit in the river. Like if you have a waterfall, the heavier minerals uh, fall right at the bottom of the waterfall and other minerals are being carried away. So all you had to do is just find these areas and then you could actually wash out the, the uh, gold. All these gold bearing minerals were emplaced in the Sierra Nevada batholiths but also into those andesite. The other one which is uh, copper, silver and zinc deposits and these uh, minerals are found in Montana and Idaho and they were emplaced as a result of Cretaceous igneous activity. There is some copper deposits in the western US which is um, porphyritic copper in the batholith, so it's in the granite batholith. Like there is a famous one in uh, next to Salt Lake City 
and then there is a bunch of these kind of copper deposits in, in um, California. We call it porphyry copper, which means the copper is just completely distributed in the granite. Uh, the other one, which is very important, are non-metallic minerals. Uh, one of the most important one is the diamond. The diamond uh, formation is is very much related to the uh, continental breakup. So as Pangaea formed and then it started to break up, that means that it had a lot of reef basin sediments. And the very very first magma magma event, which happens at the continental break breakup, is the kimberlites. The kimberlites actually are coming up like very very thin, like tube like volcano pipe like volcano and we call them kimberlite pipes and the kimberlite pipes actually are magma which are coming basically from the mantle and that's the zone where the diamond sitting so the kimberlites are the only possibility for diamonds to get up to the surface the kimberlites usually is a as I said pipe like uh, volcanic tube and so when you mine for diamonds you actually got to mine into this so-called kimberlite rocks. The, it's very, very common in Africa, Siberia, but actually around Lynchburg we have kimberlite, and um, it could ha <clears throat> there is a diamond which they found around Richmond, which might have been related to this uh, rifting in this area. These are the energy resources. The first and most important is the nuclear fuel. The uranium minerals, which are uh, one of the most important, is the carnotite, which is a yellow earthy uranium oxide, which is very characteristic in sandstones, and uh, it's associated with fossil woods. Most uranium in the U.S. Uh, mined from Jurassic and Jurassic sedimentary rock. Actually, it's not only uh, in the in the U.S. It's everywhere in the world. Like. We have a uranium deposit in Hungary, which is uh, Permian and Triassic red sandstone, so very, very similar situation. I guess it was part of the Pangaea. Um, the uranium originated in volcanic ash, and then it was transported in solution by groundwater, and it was precipitating uh, in reductive environments. Uranium bearing rocks are found in New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, and Texas. And you know, we have a big deposit in Virginia, which is definitely related to the Danville Triassic Rift Basin. So it's also related to Triassic somewhat. Uh, and then we have the fossil fuels, which is the, the coal. As you know, the coal is forming from plant remains in, in uh, coastal swamp areas. Uh, we have big deposits of low sulfur, which means not much pyrite in the coal, in the Rocky Mountain range, region. and uh, But other places in the world, there is Jurassic coal also. The oil and the gas, uh, they're primarily forming from algae, uh, planktonic, um, planktonic uh, plants and animals, really they are one cell, that's what I was thinking of, they are really uh, one cell organisms. Remember we have the zooplankton and the phytoplankton, phytoplankton photosynthesizing, zooplankton feeds on the phytoplankton. So those are the ones which go down to the bottom of the ocean that there is no oxygen, it's an oxic environment, so it cannot decay, and then it will actually become oil in the long term. Um, so a lot of the uh, Mediterranean area have, which is originally the Tethys Seaway, and then we have a bunch of, uh, in, in the western U.S., Alaska and Arctic Canada, and of course the Gulf of Mexico region and some in Australia also. This is the Mesozoic life. Uh, the Mesozoic means middle animals during which the world fauna changed characteristically, like drastically from the Paleozoic. Uh, Mesozoic is the time for the dinosaurs. 
uh, which are the most popular uh, organisms of the Mesozoic. And it started, they started in the Triassic, but they really become famous and big in the Jurassic. Except for the birds, probably you all know, I hope you do, that the dinosaurs all became extinct at the end of the Cretaceous. The Mesozoic was also time for great change in the, in the uh, terrestrial vegetation. Uh, the early Mesozoic was still dominated by ferns, cycads, gingos, and other unusual plants. Modern gymnosperms, such as conifers, first appeared in the uh, early Triassic. And by the middle Cretaceous, the earliest angiosperm, you know, those are the flowering plants, uh, have appeared and they started to diversify really quickly because uh, they are more successful than any other type of plants, actually. Uh, many of the plants and animals that were uh, to be found in the Mesozoic seas would be quite familiar because they are still around. Uh, the fish, turtles, sharks were very, very frequent and uh, they, they look very much like the ones which are around today. Um, there is notable shelly creatures which didn't survive, and those are the belemnites and the ammonites. The belemnites and ammonites. Um, the big difference was in the big predators. Instead of dolphins, seals, and killer whales, the marine mammal predators were... Uh, the great marine reptiles, remember the dinosaurs, they are the ones who uh, did everything, you know, there was nothing else around. So the predators, the, the vegetable eaters, everybody was dinosaurs at this time. The ammonites and the belemnites, these guys were uh, very, very plentiful. They are the best index fossils of the Mesozoic. Uh, they live pretty deep water. And uh, because they had this low tube-like structure, they could actually easily move up and down in the ocean uh, because they could suck air out and they could put air into their uh, shells. This is how they look like. So these are the ammonites. And um, the, the fact that they were very good index fossil is because of these low, so-called loba lines. The, the way they were, the loba lines changed every two million years, which made them really good index facets. And I have two more pictures of these ammonites. That is another one. They were very typical in this deep water uh, limestone. We call it Ammonitico Rosso, and this is really famous everywhere in Europe. Any country you go to in Europe will have this kind of rocks in the metros, the churches, every famous building built from Ammonite Corosso. Actually, it got polished really well. And when, when you look at the polished surface, it has lots of lots of ammonites. It's really, really pretty, I'm telling you. And these guys are the belemnites, and they are probably the most well-known extinct cephalopod after the ammonites. Uh, they are quite common. They look like cigar actually. And I have some cool picture like right here. These are belemnites. They are very similar to the ammonites except they are straight. And then this is when they are together. It's very famous rats coming out of Morocco and they, they uh, polish it and they try to sell it. It's really pretty rock anyways. The turtles are, are first appeared in the Triassic. They are reptiles but not part of the Arcosar group, they live in much the same way as turtles do today. So that's how you got to know about them. And then of course you already know a lot about the dinosaurs, so I'm not going to go into details about them. Uh, the dinosaurs died out at the end of the Cretaceous, really basically at the KT mass extinction. K stands for Cretaceous because in Europe we say Cretaceous with K. And the T is standing for the tertiary. So it's the basically the Mesozoic, Cenozoic boundaries, the KT mass extinction. Uh, 
they do believe that um, oh this just shows you a bunch of dinosaurs and if you know something about that you can use it for extra credit I, it's good the birds the birds evolved during the Mesozoic and they believe to have evolved uh, from Triassic tetrapods and that's a, a dinosaur group uh, actually uh, there are really good uh, transition of fossils from uh, dinosaur to birds the one of the most important one is the Archaeopteryx of course I guess you won't know the name it's really hard to memorize but this guy has bird and dino like structures it's a true transitional fossil the plants two group became dominant during the Triassic and Jura Jurassic the cycads and the gingos gingos you know the gingos are still around that's why I call them in uh, living fossils because they actually started like 220 million years ago which is crazy uh, that it seems like they evolved from seed ferns in the Carboniferous and uh, the pines, cedars and fir trees also very abundant during the Jurassic and uh, the most important thing which happened during the Mesozoic is the development of the angiosperms, remember the flowering plants. And these are the cycles in the ginga. I always go backwards for some stupid reason, but that's just the case. And this just shows you the KT mass extinction, which is right here. And we already talked about that, that the Permo-Triassic is much bigger. And actually, based on this figure, even the late Ordovician, Ordovician one is, is bigger. But the most important thing that the KT boundary is not that big. Uh, most likely the mass extinction, uh, the, the, the event which caused the mass extinction at the end of the Triassic War, uh, Cretaceous, was a big meteorite which hit the Yucatan Peninsula right there at the Gulf of Mexico. And here you can see the uh, shape of the meteorite. It must have been a really big one because actually there is an iridium layer uh, found in 75 locations around the world. This is like an iridium platinum anomaly, which if you look at the sedimentary layers going from the Mesozoic to the Cenozoic, right at that boundary, there is this low layer which has very, very unusually high iridium content, which cannot come from Earth, so it had to come from somewhere else, which, which really um, supports the the meteorite theory and as I said at the Yucatan Peninsula they have formed this meteorite impact which supports this idea. So that's the end of the Mesozoic. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, you might have not but you've got to learn some of it. So I will see you. Bye.